yeah, this image just jumped into my head from nowhere of this um, sign with dig here on it. And I thought that's my in, that's my in. I don't know what it means. I don't know who's going to dig here or what they're going to find or what the thing that they find is going to mean in terms of whatever happened um, in the backstory, but that's where I'm going to start. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks to our guest today is Lisa Jewell, who is joining us from London. She was such a terrific guest last year. We enjoy talking to her so much. We're grateful that she's able to join us today to talk about her 18th book, The Night She Disappeared, which is another Book Reporter Bets on selection. Um, I lost another day reading your book. So this year, it's only got 364 days and one day <laughs> of reading your book. So there you go. So welcome, Lisa. So good to see you. Oh, it's so lovely to see you. It's always a treat to see you. Um, but yes, thank you for having me again. Not being bored of me yet. No, I'm not bored of you at all. <laughs> I would hope to see you live because I heard you were at one point coming to the States and then all of a sudden you weren't. And I said, okay, then I can't say hello to her live. So now I'll get her on video. You know, there we go. Yes. 2022 is going to be the year of, of hugs and, yes. and selfies and book signings and, and seeing you in real life. From yeah. your lips to God's ears, believe me, yes. it's enough. Yeah. <laughs> it's really enough. So let's start by you getting us up to speed and telling us a little bit about The Night She Disappeared. Okay, so <clears throat> The Night She Disappeared, which is actually my 19th novel. 19th? Oh my yes. gosh. Yes, we got we, up. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> oh. Um, so it is, it's about um, teenage parents, Zach and Tallulah, um, who go to the pub on a date on a Friday night and they leave their baby at home with Tallulah's mum and in the pub they live they live in this very chichi village um and in the pub they bump into some kids from the local boarding school and um so they're the posh kids and um they get invited to a pool party that at this extraordinary mansion just outside the village called Dark Place and Tallulah texts her mum and says, is it OK if we go on to this party? And her mum says, of course, stay out as late as you like. And Zach and Tallulah never come home. Um, and their disappearance remains a mystery until a year later, um, a new head teacher comes to run the boarding school in the village. And his girlfriend is a mystery novelist, a detective novelist. And on her first day, um, when she's exploring the grounds of this amazing um, boarding school, she finds a sign nailed to a fence with the words dig here scrawled on it in marker pen and she digs. Uh, Sophie digs and she finds something and the, the, the clue that she unearths brings the uh, mysterious disappearances Zach and Tallulah back into the open. It is, okay, last year when we talked, you always said there's something that triggers the book. There's something that you see, something you're walking down the street. So for me, was it, did you see a sign that said dig here? Was that your No, <laughs> I did not see a sign that did that said dig here. That My brain did that for me. That was very strange, actually. I still don't know where that came from. <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the um, starting point for this novel was not quite as, as romantic or as bizarre as some of the other starting points for my other novels. Um, this was just somebody said the words boarding school. I was I was listening to them talking. Uh, it was another novelist and they were talking about their first novel and they were saying it was set in a boarding school. And at that point, I just stopped listening to what this person was saying because in my head was going, "Ooh, boarding school. I've never written a book set in a boarding school before. Wouldn't a boarding school be an amazing setting for a murder mystery? And oh, I wonder who what, what who might have died and what might have happened. And as I was and I, yeah, as I say, completely stopped listening to the person who was talking to me. Um, and as I was thinking all of these things, this yeah, this image just jumped into my head from nowhere of this um, sign with dig here on it. And I thought that's my in, that's my in. I don't know what it means. I don't know who's going to dig here or what they're going to find or what the thing that they find is going to mean in terms of whatever happened um, in the backstory, but that's where I'm going to start. So yes, it was just a gift. It was a gift that just came in. Yes, and exactly. say to the author, By the way, thank you so much for saying the two words, boarding school. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There. I have told her, I have told her, I'm very grateful to her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Tulua adores her little baby named Noah. And at the beginning, she's living with her mother who's in her late thirties. So this is a teenage mother with a teenage grandmother, you know, she's a teenage mother as well. 
And Zach then starts to embed himself in their lives. Like he comes back and he starts to make all these decisions about yes. what they should be doing with their lives. And it's interesting, like how he starts to command their lives where she's ruminating, like, I don't want this. I don't want this guy. And many women would want the guy back in their life, like to yes. help or whatever. And she's not. Did you enjoy yeah. getting into her head? Yeah. Because I feel like you had such a good time of saying, no, don't go with yeah. this guy, go someplace else. I really did enjoy that. And that wasn't something I'd been expecting to write about. I hadn't been expecting to write about Zach. Um, Zach was mentioned in passing as the father of the child who didn't want to know and was out there in the periphery somewhere leading her to raise the baby on her own. And then for some reason, he just appeared in the story. And once I'd let him in, he wouldn't leave. He was just, so he was almost doing it to me as a writer, as well as doing it to Tallulah as a character in my book. of just like, uh uh-uh, no, I'm here and you're going to work with me. Um, And yeah, and and the whole basis of the way that Zach tries to control Tallulah is comes exactly from that place of thinking, you're really lucky. Most girls in your position who get knocked up when they're teenagers don't have a man who's prepared to work hard, put money in, look after you, support you, build a future. You should be very grateful to me. Um, And you shouldn't be complaining about any of these tiny little like, you know, micro restrictions I'm putting on your life here, there and everywhere. Um, So yes, it was really, really unexpected to be writing about that dynamic in their relationship. Um, And yes, also just seeing how that, seeing where that came from that that controlling aspect of Zach's mm-hmm. personality he's so controlling he's like we're going to live in this house I've saved for us to live in this house this is what we're going to do she he brings her there she's like I have no intention of living here but yes. she doesn't know how to say that she has not found her voice to come yes. out and say this is what I really want for myself yes and- well there's a tiny bit of her that thinks he could flip Mm-hmm. So she's never pushed him far enough to see if he would be violent, but she always feels like he might be violent. But there's also the other side of it. She's so close to Kim, her mother. They're so incredibly close. So she knows that the minute she suggests to Kim that something is wrong, that there's something she's not comfortable with, um, and that she's having trouble navigating her relationship with Zach or that Zach is worrying her in some way. She knows that Kim will be down on it like a ton of bricks. And then the whole thing will be out of her control again. And, and I've been in a coercive, controlling relationship. I spent five years married to a man who tried to control me. And I know how much I wanted to keep everybody out of this relationship. You don't want other people coming into this relationship and trying to change the dynamic because... It's just such a delicate, delicate thing that exists between you and this person who's trying to control you. It's a hair trigger thing. Um, And so she doesn't bring, there's lovely Kim who adores her and thinks she knows everything about her daughter, but Tallulah can't bring her in. She can't do it because she just wants, she wants to deal with it herself. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. She wants to deal with Zach herself. And ultimately she does, you know, without spoilers, she does ultimately bring forth a plan to um, to deal with the Zach situation. But it takes a very long time and it (laughs) causes an awful lot of problems the way she drags her feet over it. But no, I absolutely understood her motivation for keeping everybody else out of her relationship. Well, you know, it's interesting right now. I don't know if you know, there's this very high profile case in the States of this woman who disappeared on a cross country trip with her boyfriend. Yes. It's, and, yeah. Um, we read about it here as yeah, well. And everybody's been tracking where it would happen. And I was thinking of her as I was reading this book, because there's clearly there's somebody in Utah. There's a cop that's saying, do you really want to stay with this man? Do you really want to do this? And it tracks very, very much the same as she's making these beautiful YouTube videos, which is the same kind of thing you think Tulu would be doing is our life is great. Everything's fabulous. At the same time, there's this edge of something is definitely wrong. There's something wrong. And I right now, this woman's fiance has disappeared. Like it comes home without her. And it, it takes so long. There are big gaps in the story of like things that are going on. And I just feel like right now we should bring in Lisa Jewell and a group of, of like thriller writers to say where he yeah. went. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get us on just, this case. Absolutely. <laughs> I just feel like you can bring them in and you can say where they might be because it's really funny. They're looking in this wildlife refuge and my husband goes, he's not there. I was like, you haven't even read that many novels. You haven't even yeah. read that many thrillers to be able to say that. He goes, not there. He goes, they're searching there, but that's not where he, where he is. And I'm like, oh, but it's like really funny because when you're reading, when you're reading a book like yours, where the person's gone for so long and then 
what ended up happening? Where did they go? Because they yes. just disappeared. They're just gone. You know? And you think you think you think it should be impossible for someone to just disappear. Mm hmm. But, and, it's like, how they do? and they disappear yeah. together so that they run off together. Were they that much in love that they just want to get away? And the vibe just doesn't work with Kim. It just doesn't work with anybody. And I, I felt like Tula, like she loves being a mom, but she's still trying to find herself. And Noah ties her to home, but she's pushing all kinds of buttons to see who she really is, which you would normally do if you're somebody who's her age. And I feel yes. like, am I right if that's what she's doing? Is she just experimenting? Well, yes, there? exactly. I mean, that's the thing. When you you can have a child as, as a child or as a teenager and be an awesome parent because all your nurturing instincts are there and all your love is there um, and all your maturity is there, but there's still vast swathes of your, of your you know, what what is the word for the the bit at the big the front of your brain that, frontal that doesn't de the frontal yes it doesn't develop. develop until you're 25 properly and that's why young people take so many risks and think they're going to live forever and make stupid decisions so she's still not formed she's formed as a mother um but she's not formed in many other ways there's lots of experiences she hasn't had yet and lots of parts of herself she hasn't explored yet and lots of things she's never considered for herself in the future so she's got this sort of like balancing act of like no i need to be here present right now solid as a rock because i'm a mother but on the other hand life keeps happening to me and things are presented to me and i've got to make decisions about the sort of person I'm going to be away from being a mother um and yeah so that's what happens when she meets Scarlett in the book you know she meets this posh girl Scarlett who you know theoretically would not be the type of person she would ever spend any time with or be friends with but Scarlett shows her this strange sort of fascinated interest and it opens something up into Lula um I think, you know, we've got to be careful about spoilers in terms of how much we say about what happens between Scarlet and Tallulah. But yeah, so it's 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 a it's a tricky road to navigate. It's, you know, parenting is hard enough at any point in your life. But when you're not sure who you are yet, mm -hmm. the more challenging. And there's a rich girl, poor girl play yeah. here going on. And there's a troubled girl, vulnerable story at well. So we've got those two tracks going back and forth and they're both about the same girl. So Scarlet as you watch is extremely damaged. She's extremely psychopathic. I mean, there's so much going on with this girl. So tell us about Scarlett and how she came about and how you, you boarding school her, is that it? Yes. Yeah, so I needed something because it was exactly that rich girl, poor girl thing that I wanted to play with in terms of what happens, um, what, what, what it was that led to Zach and Tallulah going missing and what's found in the underneath the dig here sign. So I always knew that I was going to feed Tallulah to the, a rich character at some point, and I wasn't sure who it was going to be. And I'd always assumed when I got to the point where I introduced Tallulah to the, the rich girl, um, that it would be in the environs of the village or maybe in the boarding school itself, but actually it ended up being completely off campus in a way, um, mm -hmm. in, in the college that they're both at in, in the main town. And I kind of hadn't really thought it through. I just thought, here's Tallulah sitting in the lunchroom Mm -hmm. having her packed lunch and having her canteen lunch, looking at pictures of her baby on her phone, um, feeling an ache, a primal ache. And I know that at some point she's going to look up and see the girl who's going to be the key to everything, the girl who's going to change everything. And I didn't really have an idea in my head of what sort of girl Scarlett was going to be until Tallulah looks up and sees her. And then I immediately saw Scarlett and she's not your classic sort of alpha female kind of cheerleader. Mm -hmm type at all she's quite boyish looking she's very tall she's very thin she's flat chested she's a bit sort of scabby looking in a way her hair is there the roots are showing and she dresses like a boy but she's got something some sort of overwhelming charisma that not only Tallulah finds intoxicating but everybody who comes into contact with Scarlett mm -hmm. finds intoxicating whether it's you know her, her head teacher's husband or the the posh the posh boy um the the farm the son of the farmer or you know, everyone who comes into contact with with um Scarlett feels it um and yeah I don't really know where she came from I wanted her to be sort of slightly subversive I didn't want mm -hmm. her to be it, tossing her blonde hair behind her shoulders um, with her designer handbag sort of girl that everyone would have a crush on. Um, yeah, so she was quite, she was fascinating 
to write. Absolutely fascinating and not based on anyone I know in real life. Mm -hmm. She's dark. She's edgy. She's all these things, but she's got this magnetic attraction that she's just pulling people in around her. Yeah. And then she becomes the lead head girl and she becomes the mean girl and she becomes yes. this and she plays every different role according to who she's talking to and what she feels she needs from them or to play with yes. them. Play with them. Yes. Uh, uh, towards the end of the book, Tallulah finally gets it. And she says something along the lines of that. She realized that Scarlett only saw herself as a reflection in other. So she didn't know who she was unless she could see somebody else's response to her. And then she'd be, oh, look, there I am, because that person thinks I'm amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I must be amazing. But the, so her, her sense of confidence didn't come from her. It's not an inner, innate confidence. Mm -hmm. It came because, you know, she's, her, yeah, her, her family upbringing was quite, I think, lacking in, in nurturing and care and love and tenderness. So she had to suck it out of other people. Um, mm -hmm. Her shallowness means she's got to get her depth from other people. She's so shallow that exactly. she's going to go and grab whatever she can to, you know, help create her. And then the setting here contributes as well. There's a small town, there are working class people. And then there's this mansion outside of town called the dark place. And I just love the description of this place. It sounds like, you know, six different houses put together. So what inspired that? And tell us about that house, because I loved it. Again, I mean, that was a bit like when I introduced Scarlet into the narrative in that I knew that it was coming. So I knew Scarlet was coming, but I didn't know what she was going to be until I started writing her. And it was the same with the house. I knew that clearly if she'd been to a, part, a pool party at this house and Scarlet owned it and she was like a very rich girl, I knew that I was going to be about to describe a really beautiful house. And I vaguely had a sense of what because we, we first see it when Kim is walking up the driveway, um, uh, when Kim is walking up the driveway, uh, pushing Noah in the buggy in the middle of a heat wave, sweating profusely and not realizing that the driveway is a mile long. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the first time we see the house. So as we were walking up the driveway with Kim, my imagination was just firing off in terms of this house, this house is going, I've made her walk a mile up the driveway to get to it. It's going to be absolutely incredible. And yeah, so it's just this sort of, I mean, I'm obsessed with houses anyway. I particularly love old houses. Mm -hmm. um, and I love modern architecture as well. And just so I just threw everything at it. I just thought, let's just, let's just give this house everything. So, and I even wrote it a Wikipedia entry. Um, <laughs> I wrote a Wikipedia page for it, which is in the novel. And so, yes, yeah, so it's got the, the original building was built in the 16th century and then it burnt down, um, which is why it was called the Dark Place. So for many years, there was just a dark circle of ash where the house had been. Then it was rebuilt in the 17th century. Then there was a t uh, extensions built on it over and over again over the years, um, including an, um, uh, Scarlett's family who moved in and put a big glass box on the back of it um, to bring it into the, you know, the current century. Um, and yeah, I just loved that house. It was just a fantasy house. And it's the pool outside and everyone playing in the pool. And you could see, like I saw the pool was on this side of the house. The house yes. was over here, but I could very much see it exactly the way this place was unfolding, how the house was wrapping around. You could see somebody maybe looking out the window to look down at the people on the pool. It was very well drawn. It was. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed describing that house. I absolutely love describing that house. I'm glad you got a good sense of it. I was totally there. I was totally there in the bedrooms. I was up and down. So then we've got Ho Sophie who writes these cozy mysteries under the name of PJ Fox, which I just love. I, I love that she's got initials. I just love the whole way this comes together. And she's relocated with her um, fiance, husband, boyfriend. Boyfriend. In fact, they've boyfriend. only been together for six months. Boyfriend. They've only been dating for six months when she joins him down in the countryside. Yeah. So they're going to, he's working as the head of this posh school. She's going to go to this boarding school with them. They're not together that long. And she ends up as the start of the investigation. And she's not really sure, wait a second, I write all these mysteries, but am I really an investigator? Like I see dig here. Oh my gosh. Now I'm in the middle of a book. Like I'm in the middle yes. of something that I am supposed to write myself out of. How do I do it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there, there, there's a scene where she, she goes to the local pub and she knows from her investigation 
having found this sign that this was the pub where Zach and Tallulah had been for a drink the night before they disappeared. And she realizes that working behind the bar is Tallulah's mum. She recognizes her from a photograph in a newspaper report. And um, she's thinking, if I was one of my, so she writes this series about um, a pair of detect uh, private eyes, private investigators, um, Susie and Tiger. And she was like, if I was Susie, I would just go up and ask her some questions, but I can't, I'm Sophie. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a private eye. And uh, so she's got this real like battle of like wanting to do what her characters would do, but also realizing that she's got no legitimate reason to go and, and, and interrupt this woman and ask her personal questions. Well, probably the most investigative skills simply because if you've developed characters so long, you might know where they go, what they do. Yeah. Give me a little bit more. Where, what was she eating that night? Where did you think they went? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or in fact, what a lot of um, writers of mysteries and suspense novels do is just very, uh, use very strong instincts. So mm -hmm. again, she probably has those the, the same sort of instincts that her fictional detectives would have, but uh, yes, not, not in a position to use them in the same way. Yeah, she doesn't know anybody in the town to sit there and say, no, no, the writer, she, could you just, she's literally well, just arrived. She's literally just arrived. And she feels like she's just landed in the middle of a huge coincidence. But yeah. spoiler free, um, it's not quite so much of a coincidence as it seems. So. No, nothing is quite, quite the way it is. You know, you use the past tense and the present tense as you told the story. You went back and forth, you went back and forth in voices. Talk to us about that because it worked so well because I always knew where I was. A lot of times Good. I get lost and I, I yes. hate being lost in a book. Yeah. There's nothing worse. <laughs> yeah. And I don't put, I don't put like um, title headers on it either. I don't put like Sophie or, or put the year or whatever, because I think that means I don't try as hard to make the chapters distinct from each other. And I think it's much easier for the reader if they're not being signposted with mm -hmm. like little headers, if it's just intrinsic inside the words that they're reading, exactly whose scene it is, exactly which year it's set in. Um, and one, and I found that I was really worried about this book because I normally have, um, I normally have a teenager. So I have my teenager, mm -hmm. but I normally have a male voice as well. So that makes it easier for the reader to differentiate. Mm -hmm. like, oh, it's a man, so I know who that is. Oh, it's a grown woman, so I know who that is. Oh, it's a teenager, so I know who that is. Because these were three females I was a bit worried that it was going to get a bit more confused, but because Tallulah's story is backstory, I put her all in the um, past tense. Um, and with, yeah, Sophie and Kim, I put them in, in the present tense. I didn't have any first person in this one. I quite often use a first person as well. To, yeah, it was, yeah. No, there wasn't was. in this one, but quite often that's another thing that I can do to make it obvious to the reader which bit of the book yeah. they're in where Maybe. we are yeah and that's important because so many times you're reading and you don't know where you are it's like yes. well, and everybody acted like their character like they stayed in character every once in a while you're reading something and somebody drops out and I was like oh they missed that they totally yeah. missed that you know you, she would not do that there was yeah. no way but it was everybody <laughs> was very much true to themselves you know oh thank you that's really good it is really good because I I know from reading in the genre myself that it it's it can be quite disconcerting when mm -hmm. you're when you're you're deep in the story and then you suddenly realize you've been reading a chapter thinking it was a different character different and then yeah. it can really throw you so and it's quite important to me that that doesn't happen when people read my book so I'm very happy to hear that thank you yeah they were fully formed everybody was fully formed every character I felt like I could completely see them and I could see like who they would be like not like you know, we never think for television but if you if they were doing something live you could see who they would be because they would be themselves and you saw who kim was and you definitely saw who private investigator not really was <laughs> i mean it was oh my gosh why do you keep giving me these signs why do you keep giving me these things and why am i living in this town where this yeah. craziness is going on like yes. why, why do i have to be here now you know why me yes i, exactly. I can't write a word because i'm obsessed yes. with this investigation i can't do my work because Something yeah. really is happening that, you know. I yeah, and actually, ironically, um, Sophie, because I was originally going to have a male point of view and it was going to be her partner, Sean, mm -hmm. and I wrote the first chapter of, of them arriving at the boarding school from his point of view, and I just kind of didn't gel with him. And I actually thought his girlfriend, I don't know, I think she could be a much more interesting character mm -hmm. to, to 
do all this sort of um, exploration um, and unco uncover all these clues, but I hadn't really given her any thought. She was just Sean's girlfriend and I would worry about her later. But the minute I realized I was gonna put her center stage, I thought, well, I kind of should have some kind of handle on who she is and what she does and how did she manage to just up sticks from London and move down to the countryside um, and what sort of job she might have. And I kind of toyed with, oh, maybe she does something on the internet or you know, something that you can do working from home. And then I thought, of course, she could be a novelist. Perfect job for her. And she's got plenty of time to sort of fart about and sort of <laughs> procrastinate and not, not, not get any work done without anybody breathing down her neck. Um, so, yeah, it was the absolutely perfect job for her. And then the fact that her job feeds into what's going on mysterious goings yeah. on in the scenes was something that was sort of I put in retroactively I didn't make her I because I didn't know she was going to be a detective novelist until I'd already set up the nuts and bolts of the story right um it was just a bit it was just a bit of lovely magical luck that I managed to tie the two things up so it looked like I meant to do that all along. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the way it was supposed to happen, everyone. Yeah, it's Perfect. always supposed to happen like that. So, yes. Yes. Looking, I'm a genius, was, you see. <laughs> I was making like a little map in my head of where everything was. Okay, you walk to the little pub and then yeah. you go to the boarding school. And yeah. and also Sean wouldn't have been as interesting because what is no. he doing? He's running the school. He's like, running he's that's exactly what I thought. I thought he's gonna be way too busy. He's going to be way too busy. I had like imagined him, I'd imagined using him to meet all the interesting kids who go to this boarding school because this boarding school is for 16 to 19 year olds who are struggling at other schools or struggling, whose parents have got lots and lots of money and have got these children who are either struggling with issues like ADHD or dyslexia or struggling with substance abuse issues or just struggling with just not taking their education very seriously. So they throw them into this incredibly expensive um, posh school and hope that they're gonna pass their exams there. And I've been going to use Sean to like meet all these interesting characters like children of rock stars and princesses from Kazakhstan and what have you. And that all went by the vice. It was just like, and that's exactly why I couldn't yeah. use him. He'd have been way too busy meeting princesses from Kazakhstan and children of rock stars to be sort of, yeah tootling we, around the, the grounds looking for clues <laughs> and he's not the teacher so he's not talking to the kids one-on-one -on -one all day long yeah they would be picking things up no she was yeah, definitely not definitely in office. No, I made the right decision I definitely made the right decision definitely yeah. did so now let's get back to dig here because at the beginning of the book and I went back and figured we read this today you know that Tallulah has let me see arachnophobia and Tallulah is in the dark Tell us about why you drop there before we even come to know her. Like it's way up front. And I, yeah. it's one of those things where I've started to go back and read these things at the end because the author put it there for a reason. She didn't just throw yes. this out there. Yeah. Well, that's, so I often put my little mini chapter thing. So it's not quite a prologue. And I've done this with a few books. I wouldn't call it a prologue. It's only like half a page long. And I'll often put that there when I get to a point in the book where I suddenly think, okay, I kind of know what this book might be about now. And what I'd really like is for my reader to have a sense of what this book is about the minute they pick it up, rather than having to wait for me as a writer to have written, you know, 150 pages mm -hmm. <laughs> of working out what it's about. So uh, yeah, and that was, I, I hadn't kind of, I certainly hadn't designed the book to have this tunnel. There's a tunnel mm -hmm. under dark place. Um, that's not a spoiler. We know about the tunnel quite early on in the book. Um, and yes, yeah, so once I realized there was this tunnel under the house and I hadn't quite decided what function this tunnel was going to play in the denouement or in the, the disappearance of Zach and Tallulah, but I knew it was going to have some function, some very important function. I thought, let's just, and I did kind of, yeah, just stick it on the beginning, mm -hmm. but let's just show the reader, you know, what what's what, what's going to kick off at some point in this book and and yeah get no. their imaginations ready for it and get you realizing there's no way you could do it either you know do I yeah. have that <laughs> you mean we yeah. say wait do I have that too you know yeah. and you always knew at the beginning who was going to be missing did you play around with that at all was that was yeah you? I think that was the only thing I did know so that I wrote a book called watching you um mm -hmm. about three years ago and um that starts with a dead body on, on the uh, uh, <clears throat> cover uh, with a in a pool of blood in a ki on a kitchen floor, and I wrote that scene without knowing if it was a man or a woman. I didn't know who it was. I knew it was one of one of sort of three or four potential 
people it could have been um so I have started books with absolutely no idea of who's dead or who's missing or um but with this one I knew it was Tallulah Mm -hmm. the Zach thing kind of came later like I said he did inveigle his way he did inveigle his way into my novel quite forcefully um so yeah so that's how he ended up being you know the part of the the missing couple as opposed to the missing teenage girl missing teenage girl Yeah, yeah yeah Who was your favorite character to write? Definitely the Tallulah. Definitely Tallulah. I love writing teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, I just absolutely love writing teenagers. And I also love writing the characters who I kind of wasn't expecting to write about. So I'd originally set out with just um, Sophie and Kim's points of view. Um, and I was going to allude to um, Tallulah's backstory through them. And then I just thought, no, this is taking too long. It's taking too long. I need to know more about Taluna. I need to know it all right now. Otherwise, I can't carry on. Uh, so I thought I'm going to have to bring her in as, as one of my, as, a, as another character. And um, yeah, so she came in quite late in the day. And because I don't hang around, once I've decided I'm going to do something, I do it. Uh, so she just had to sort of bring herself to life very, very quickly on the page. And at, like I say, I start with that scene where it's her first day at college, the first time she's left her baby behind. And she sees this girl in the lunchroom and uh, yeah. And I didn't know, I didn't know what was going to happen. I knew it was going to end in something bad, and the, yeah, but I didn't know what it was going to be at that point. So, and I certainly didn't know that Zach was going to be part of her life. Mm-hmm. And I just loved her. I just loved her. She's just so tender mm-hmm. and pure and quiet. And uh, yeah, just that girl you don't notice until you know stop and noticing her what I really saw is how much Tulula loves the baby she loves the baby she loves being with the baby when she's apart from him when she's not with Noah she's like not super happy she, like, she doesn't want to pawn him off on her mother she no. wants to be his mother yes. and she very much wants to be um taking care of him so when she goes away it's with some trepidation every single time she leaves him because yes. he's more of her life than anything else he is yes. and she's realizing though that she's missing a lot of things for that love she has of him she's yeah. like torn you know That's yeah what yeah no it, it, it and it was it was really tender and wonderful for me to write those scenes because obviously you know I haven't been a teenage mother I can't imagine how I would have responded to finding myself in that position mm-hmm. at her age and I certainly found babies very difficult even as 35 year old mother first time mother I found it very very challenging and was very happy in fact if I had the chance to go out and leave my mm-hmm. baby with somebody else <laughs> um, <laughs> not that my baby liked me leaving her with anybody else um but yeah so I was absolutely feeding directly into to to Lula there um not there was none of me in that I was just absolutely inhabiting this sweet quiet 19 year old girl who's just obsessed with her baby and every time she walks into the house when she hasn't been with him she scoops him up and she smells him and she touches him and um Every time she interacts with her mother when she's at college, she's just like, how's Noah? What are you doing? Um, and yeah, I just, I, I loved, I loved being able to create that relationship on the page. I loved creating the relationship between Tallulah and her mother, mm-hmm. between Tallulah and Kim, such yeah. a beautiful mother-daughter relationship. And then I loved the fact that that was now feeding through into her own relationship with her own child. And there is a scene where, um, after Tallulah's gone I know it's actually when Tallulah's still there and they're all three of them in the kitchen Tallulah Kim and the baby and Zach's out playing football as he does every Sunday morning it's the only time that they have this this little window of of opportunity just for the three of them to be together and it's just this sort of magical thing the energy that flows between the three of them is just Mm -hmm. pure it's just pure love um yeah I really really enjoyed writing that dynamic you could see it because it was this love of, of the baby, but you also find that like, he's interesting too, because whenever, like even later on, Kim is wheeling him and it's not just the baby's in the stroller, the baby's doing something like there's, yes. he's, he becomes his own little character of whether he's yes. doing the Cheerios or whatever he's doing. He's like part of it. Yeah. yeah. And he's actually, yeah, he's a handful and he's quite <laughs> dark. Um, and it's interesting. I watched this movie when I was halfway through writing this book with, um, Sienna Miller she's playing an American in it and she is a young grandmother and her daughter who is the young daughter of a son 
goes missing. I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called The American Wife. Mm, I, don't know I can't it. remember. Yeah. Um, and I was like, dang, someone's already had my idea. I'm writing this and somebody else has already written it. Um, but it was interesting to me that in that movie, the son is an angel and the son loves his grandma. Mm -hmm. And the son is just always saying charming, delightful, funny things and just being beautiful. And, and I just thought, no, that's not how it's going to go for Noah and Kim. Noah is going to give Kim a run for her money. He is mm -hmm. going to make her yeah, work for work for everything. He's going to be a handful. Yeah. Um, and and when you've got a toddler who's a handful, they don't just sit quietly in the buggy when you're pushing them around. They're they're asking you questions and demanding things and kicking off and um and yeah, throw, throwing their throwing their Cheerios off the high chair and what have you. Um yeah, so that was another fun yeah. thing to write. Is just just like, no, life doesn't work like that. Just yeah, just because your daughter's gone missing, it doesn't mean that your grandson is going to just be a perfect angel and make it all worthwhile at all. Um yeah, so that was that was very fun to write. It, it was funny too because so much of social media right now, I think it'd be so tough to be a young mom because all these children are always happy. And I was like, does no one cry? Yeah. You know what? It's like these beatific pictures. And if you're a young mom, you seem to think like, well, that's what everybody else's child is like. Why is yeah. mine like climbing the walls or whatever? Yes. And you never see like bad things happening. You just, I know some, somebody wrote one night, she goes, and this is after screaming in the hallway for 15 minutes. And <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was so grateful that somebody actually screamed in the hallway for 15 minutes because yes. no one does. It's exactly. Perfect exactly yeah yeah it, it's quite dangerous isn't it this sort of idea that children just enhance your existence when so often particularly at that age they don't enhance your existence in any way um the, the love you have for them is is obviously magic but the day-to-day minute-by-minute challenges <laughs> well I can say to my son who's one's 26 and one's 31 let's take a picture of the family and I have to go through like 50 shots to get one where no one is making a face that's wrong. Seriously, <laughs> they're that age and they still sabotage your photographs. And they're just sitting there like, you know, like this kind of a look. Oh, no. like and you're sitting there like, do we have to crop different heads together from different <laughs> pictures because you just can't smile? Like just do the it. Only way you, the only way I now can get a picture with my children and, and me and it looking, looking pleasant is to hand my camera to a stranger. <laughs> So if I give it to a waiter in a restaurant and ask him to take a picture of us, oh, yes. <laughs> but if I've got the camera, forget it. <laughs> Especially if it's a cute waiter. If you have to find yeah, a cute yeah. waitress, you know what I mean? Somebody that you really want yes. to smile for, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like too funny, too, too funny. So you wrote this book during the pandemic and I read that you actually rented a place so you could write because you usually write in coffee shops, you write here. Yes. Last time yeah. I think you were renovating your house and you were in a different house. I can't remember, but yes, now, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> where were you now? Where do you, so you just found a place to go, right? Yeah, it was um they're like student accommodation units um across the street. And they're, they're mainly rented out to foreign students. And of course, there were no foreign students in London at that point because they'd all gone home because of the pandemic. Um, so I just rented one and used it as an office. It was just across the street. And technically I shouldn't have been even been doing that. I shouldn't actually have been opening my front door, crossing the street and going into another building. But I just thought I have to. I, it says you should. The, 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 the guidance at the time was work from home if you can. And I just thought I can't. I actually cannot work from home. And I know there are other people who are homeschooling their children and running businesses from home. <laughs> um and but, but they're amazing and I can't do that so yeah I rented this this unit and wrote the night she disappeared there and it was very very effective um not having ever had to pay for writing space before as well I found that very um yeah very motivating very <laughs> motivating it's like how much am I paying a day for this right get on with it <laughs> do we need another month no we don't we're going no, to sit down no. and do this yeah now. <laughs> exactly <laughs> let's just get what's like you know cracked rent now where are you now so what's going on back to London normal now or where are you yeah is London it? feels normal yeah London feels normal your mask wearing is a thing that is sort of becoming uh less and less kind of uh 
obvious. Uh, you still have to wear masks on the London underground system. Um, and I always wear a mask in my local supermarket because everybody else does. So I just go with the crowds. If nobody's wearing one, I won't wear one. If everyone's wearing one, I'll wear one. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, I don't know if it's the same over there, but everybody here has got COVID now. It's just totally normal. Just like, oh, how are you? Oh, I've got COVID. <laughs> um, but because of everybody being, you know, got very high vaccination uptake and it all just feels quite good quite normal it's, different. it's funny because yeah. um i hear from people like in australia if they're in lockdown again oh. like they can't leave uh, and i was just there like oh my gosh you keep going back and forth doing this and i have to admit the other day i was running we have a ups box where we get our mail and i was halfway into the store when i realized i hadn't put on a mask and they're like it's okay <laughs> because yes. i was about to run back to the car and i was yeah. like oh my gosh like where is this because it's not with me all i have is my key like that yeah. was it um, I've been more and more times. I feel like, uh, and my son, like, you know, just pushes it around his neck and then pulls it yes. up as needed. He's yes. flown all over the place and he doesn't mind like getting on an airplane for five hours wearing a mask. And I'm like, no. yeah, not my thing. Uh, yeah, no, I've done, I've done four and a half hours on a plane with a mask on. Yeah. And I've been abroad as well. I've managed to go on holiday a few times, uh, okay. over the course of all this as well, which is, uh, a lot of people haven't managed to do that. Haven't been so lucky. So yeah, yeah. but I do, I just feel like we're getting there. I just mm -hmm. think things might change again, but I don't think things will ever be as bad as they were a year ago or six no. months ago, even. No, when so. you were sitting and writing that book, it was like not the same. It was just a different no. world. You know? It was a different world. Yes. Yeah, totally exactly. World. So was the title always? No. And I should just Do you want to try and guess what my working title was? Oh my gosh. Let me think. It was something, it was something about, wait. Oh, wait, was it just, like dig here was it oh dig here oh it could have been couldn't it it wasn't far off it was dark place dark place okay yeah okay. which is i thought was a really good title but yeah. apparently it was just a little bit too a little bit too dark for a lisa jewel novel mm -hmm. um and not um not enough narrative kind of function in it they like okay. my titles to give the reader an idea of what might be happening inside the book right so i guess the night she disappeared tells like us like she big night here yes exactly the main thing are we getting yeah. it so that was chosen by my uk publishers and then my us publishers loved it as well um and there it is now, i like how it. do you get edited do you get edited first in the uk and then in the us or do they share or do you um notes? yeah it's it was supposed to be shared but functionally that's kind of impossible. There's, there was this idea that both editors would read it at the same time and then they'd sort of like combine their notes into one big, but my UK editor edits in a very particular way. She prints off my manuscript and writes on it with a pen, mm -hmm. um, which uh, my US editor doesn't work like that. A, she doesn't work like that. And B, if she did work like that, how would, how would she get it? And then my UK editor comes and sits in my kitchen and goes through it page by page and explains what she means by things. Um, so even though it was supposed to be this sort of equal kind of input thing, it has ended up being, I'm still mainly edited by my UK editor. And that works for me brilliantly. Number one, because I love the way she edits. I love having everything on the page mm -hmm. um, rather than quite often you get editing notes. So it'll say, oh, on chapter three, the second paragraph, you describe blah, blah. Maybe you could look at this, that, and the other changes to that. And then you're like, okay, all right, what sort of changes? And you're going back and, uh, whereas my UK editor just scribbled on it and told mm -hmm. me exactly. Um, and also because, um, so that's quite unusual, the way she edits, but also another unusual thing is she's very, very happy to get a, um, a very rough draft, mm -hmm. which, so, and she's the only editor I've ever had that I feel comfortable giving a rough draft to normal and with all my previous editors i've been no don't look yet it's not ready it's not ready whereas i feel comfortable giving her something that's not ready and knowing that she will only say things that i agree with and that will make it better right so right. that's how it works that is yeah. how it's yeah yeah and then of course my us editor obviously then will edit she'll, she'll get it and then i'll get a whole nother set of editing notes from her and that's fine it works well people you realize how much you really have to love a book like love the subject that you're working on because it's not just the writing that first time round. it's the rewriting it's yeah. the reading of the page proofs and then it's talking about the book for two months when the book comes out in the yes. uk and the united states yes. by zoom or whatever and just saying yes. the same things over and over you know so yes. if you don't like it mm. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I was talking to a friend over the weekend who's uh, written her first novel um, and it's with an agent. So she hasn't got a publishing deal yet, but she's got an agent, which is brilliant. And I said, oh, no, but the other friend who'd never heard about it before said, what's it about? And she had to take this really deep breath and just she was all like sort of cringing about it, like, oh, God, I just and I just said, you're getting a publishing deal. You need to. (laughs) You will be doing this so much, you will not believe how much of your life you're going to spend telling people about this book. And you need to get this kind of get get over this sort of feeling that it's cringy or that you can't yeah, do it. That's exactly. <laughs> and you also have to sit there and say, who's going to give me a question that I haven't heard before? Who's yes. going to bring up something that I haven't thought about, a different twist? And a lot yes. of times that happens with book groups or whatever, but it's like as people are interviewing you. Well, who's seeing something like really, I thought that line was dig here because I remember last year, you said it was the man that was outside the posh school when the mothers were waiting and he didn't look, I was right. So I said to Ariel, I bet it's dig here. I bet that's what it is. And it was so right. funny and I, because <laughs> I remember you said, it's like, you remember it, just get you going. Uh, and as you're reading now, you're like, okay, what was it that got her there? What was it? You no. Know? Oh, amazing that that stayed in your memory. It stayed completely. So long, stayed. yeah. <laughs> in fact, when I was saying to people when they were reading the other book, I said, okay, now let me tell you where her idea came from for this book. And it was just so <laughs> funny. It was like, now I feel like I'm in the loop. I'm in the now. You know? <laughs> How about the cover? Was the UK cover, I assume, is different because they're always Yeah, different. so the UK cover is, I believe, do I have it behind me? Yeah. So it's um, it's blue. Okay, yeah. But yeah, so it's got a girl walking through some woods and the light shining down on her. Um, And yeah, and that's my American cover, which is I don't know if you can zoom in on the detail. So it's a swimming pool. It's clearly a swimming pool. Yes, that little. Yes, I love to swim. So I totally got that was the swimming pool. But did you see the ring? No, I didn't see the ring. Oh, There's yeah. a ring floating yes. down through the water. Yes, an engagement ring. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. was my idea. Oh, that's so great. So they showed me this artwork and I said, oh my God, that is absolutely stunning. But do you think we could have a little ring? A little ring down? dropping down. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it definitely is there. It's there like dripping. Oh, now I get. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> There's something. There's something really, really big. So <laughs> jo- let me see if I can get her name. Joanne Frogert. Frogget? Yes, Frogget. Frogget, yeah. Frogget narrates the audio. And now readers, okay, you bet you're not going to know her name, but I'm going to tell her that she's Anna Bates on Downton Abbey. And then I went and looked that up because I, I know that right now there are a lot of actresses that are jumping in doing like audio because they can't you know, do anything else, you can act anything, you can talk. So I just went, okay, let me go see who she is. And I was like, oh, it's Anna. Now yes. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, and I speak, I'm sat, I'm sitting here going, yeah, yeah, and I never watched Downton Abbey, to my shame. <laughs> never watched it, but I did know, I'd seen her obviously doing lots of interviews and, and I knew exactly who she was and it was all very exciting. And that has been, that's an, a, a thing, that, as you say, that really came out of the pandemic and lockdown right. and what have you, that there was suddenly, there was this massive crossover between uh, audiobooks and and proper famous actors. Mm-hmm. Um, and suddenly my my publishers were sending me lists of actors I'd heard of saying these are the people we're shortlisting to narrate your new book and it's just yeah it's it's quite exciting you probably like it It has a big house (laughs) yeah it's got a very big house there's lots of very big house and people die people die I don't know probably have some spare time you could do a couple seasons of that and be okay you know (laughs) either that or just watch the movie the movie will give you the crypt notes you'll be fine you'll be fine (laughs) So do you listen to audiobooks? Do you actually listen? I or- don't. I don't. Yeah. I am. Um, yeah, no, I don't. And I feel like maybe it's, they're so popular now. Yes. I can't believe yeah. what percentage of my book sales are now audio. It's just gigantic. Um, so um, once or twice a year, I'm asked by my publishers here in the UK and in the US to sign tip-ins, which for those who don't know what a tip-in is, it's a, it's a basically, it's a page of your book um and you sign it with your signature and then it goes to the presses and they drop it into the presses when they're binding your book um and yes I've had to set sign several thousands of those over the last few years and obviously when you're signing things you know seven thousand it takes 
hours it takes like hours days and hours days. It take me days. yeah nope. you can't do anything else um you can't watch tv or so i did i, I started listening to um podcasts mm-hmm. so yeah but i i am thinking next time i'm signing tip-ins i'm going to maybe experiment with listening to my first audio book mm-hmm yeah well, what the fuss is all about well, when we drove into the city i used to listen a lot more because i would just be in the car for so long but yeah. now that we're home i don't have as much time i could be from going from upstairs to downstairs and yeah with my computer. <laughs> I'm like, okay there's 12 steps and then she's yeah. there and then what happens <laughs> and i find that i'm trying to like listen at different times i try to download to my phone so that i'll go with wherever i am but for authors i joke that it used to be the um audio rights like like your rights to finland like they, they yeah. weren't going to be that big and now yes, all of a exactly sudden, when you look at your numbers like people say oh the print sales were x last week and i'm like no 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 you gotta tell me print yeah. e and audio together exactly. and it's a completely different number than what that just one other number is and yes. it's you know yeah. it's just, particularly so when you're listening. looking at hardback as well yes when you have when the hardcover publication comes out lots of people don't like hardcovers and would rather mm-hmm. wait for the paperback Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously with an audio or an ebook, you've got nothing to wait for. You're just mm-hmm. straight in with your audio. So that then the numbers look even bigger in comparison to the print, the print numbers when you're in the hardcover publication phase. Um, yeah, it, and what you notice too is book clubs are reading them earlier as a result because everybody can get the other formats. And yes, in my book club, it's young mom's book club, and they well, I'm lucky enough that they put me and let me be in the club. And they'll sit there and they'll say they listen on audio, like while they're cleaning the house, while they're doing other things, because that's their free time. Yes. So a lot of audio listening, when we get together, it's like, oh, I didn't really love the narrator. I love the narrator. And others of us who haven't done that, it's, it's a whole other experience they've had with the book. Yes, absolutely. I do feel like that. I do feel like I'm missing out on an experience. And I think it's time, time for me to do an audio book. Definitely. Yeah, and it's, it's got to be. You know, it could be listening to somebody interpreting yours. Like, first of all, just to hear how they like it, to play it back a couple of chapters. And then yeah. from there, there's some really good ones out there. And you sit there and you're, wow, oh, this is like a performance. This is like, you know, quite well done. So yes, yes, but, exactly. So what are you working on now? And are you working in the coffee shop again? Or are you? Oh, like- so God, this is really awkward for me at the moment. I'm in a real state of flux and I need to find a solution because this is my main writing chunk of the year. Right. September to December is when I pretty much write the last half of the book. Um, and I tried going back to my coffee shop. It was summer and it was quite hot and they had put the air conditioning up so high um they had turned the music up really loud it used to be nice background gentle music they turned it up and there were signs everywhere saying you could only use your oh they'd covered over all the sockets so you couldn't charge anything taped over all the sockets there were signs everywhere saying that you couldn't sit with your laptop for longer than an hour Mm. and I just thought oh this is clearly not going to be I'm never going to write here again um, there are other coffee shops. Obviously, I live in central London. There are coffee shops everywhere, but I can't quite. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I need that sort of, oh, get me out. And I don't know. I feel a bit sort of weird about going to a different coffee shop. Um, but I still have issues at home in as much as my my elder daughter is taking a gap year before mm-hmm. university. And she's fabulous, but she's around and she's like... Um, a fitness freak and so she's constantly in the kitchen like making protein snacks and powders and she has about six meals a day <laughs> and she has to cook them all properly and I work in the kitchen oh, and I'm trying I'm trying to focus but I'm finding it really hard and mm-hmm. I did put a desk in the spare bedroom but the spare bedroom is slightly subterranean and I feel a bit trapped down there mm-hmm. I don't want to work there so I don't know I don't know what to do I don't know where to write I need to find a solution to this but to answer the first bit of your question which is a bit more positive um I'm writing a sequel to the family upstairs so oh, okay all oh, right yes yes oh, that'll be fun first time you've done fun. a sequel this is the first time? I, no I did a sequel 10 or 11 books ago um so my first novel was called Ralph's Party and I wrote a sequel to that 10 years later called After the Party um which is my least favorite of all my books mm. say that about any qualms my least favorite of all my books so I've always had this sort of never again will I write a sequel but this one just seemed to beg a sequel and then my reader started begging for a sequel and then I just mm-hmm. thought I could quite like to write a sequel so that's what I'm writing at the moment but I just need to get my stuff together and find the place where I'm going to write it and you know what I keep thinking 
I keep thinking I want to rent one of those units again, but I yep. can't. I can't justify it. It's so expensive and there's no lockdown and I just need to find another coffee shop that works for me. Maybe there's a anyway. friend with a room in their house and you could just go there. Like seriously. Yeah, but then they'd probably keep coming in and talking to me as well. It's just <laughs> I, I have to drop into the zone. I read a newsletter every, and I, it's not a novel, but I write every Friday night. And to get into the zone of doing it sometimes, it's like yeah. I have nothing. Like I'll just throw, yes. I have nothing. I don't Stop know what I'm going to do. Yes. And as I recently, I've been writing on my phone and I've been sending myself notes on my phone and I've been doing like I've, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote almost the whole thing on my phone because what I realized is that it could create this little world. It was just like this big of doing it. I'm not going to do that every week, but yeah. it was, oh, it was time. This yeah. is how I'm going to get it done. You know, and I have an office here. It's like a great office here. Nobody comes up and bothers me, but it's getting your head in the zone as well as being in the right place really matters. Yes. You know? yes. And I haven't got, I haven't found that yet. And it's yeah. nearly October. It's nearly October. I need to work on it, sort it yeah. out, but I will. I always do. Find yeah. It's, it. It, there's times where I've been in like at conferences and I've been in a hotel and I can bang out stuff because there's no distraction. There's nobody like looking for me and stuff like that. So yeah, the place across the street might at least get you started in the zone because you're like you said, you're realizing you're spending money. So I have to yes. move this along. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm gonna try and do it for free first. That would be my long desperate last ditch attempt. Yeah. Friend that's out of town that the house, they want the house sitting, you're there. You know what I yeah. mean? You, do, do yeah. that. you should put up a little ad like that, you know? It's like one of those um Airbnbs. Like I'm just gonna go yeah. watch your house for you. <laughs> yeah, maybe I, I should go do that. Oh my gosh, Lisa, it's always such fun. Can't wait to see it because you will pull it off. You know, after all these years, you will pull it off. I will pull it off. I know I will. It'll be hairy, but I will, I'll do it. You'll do it. You'll do it because your editor is going to call at some point and you're going to go, okay, I'll just go rent the place across the street. It's all right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's exactly what I'm going to end up doing. (laughs) Exactly. Meanwhile, (laughs) love this. Absolutely loved it. It was like one sit read because I was into the pool. I was into where they were. And I really thought dig here was it. I really thought so, you know? Yeah. Excellent. Oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And, thank you so much for and joining us. Thank you us. for having me. And next time for the hugs. For the hugs in person. I will find you. Yes. I will find you. Okay. Yes. yes. Thanks for joining us. Thank this time. you for having me. Lovely to see you. Lovely. Bye. And to our readers, forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to.